Hello, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a black sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I am Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. Are you ready, Daphne? I, yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> We're in what, this, episode 12 now? Uh, we are in episode 12, and this is a really big one. And I yeah. have a lot to say. I know. Yeah, you warned me. So <laughs> I'll, I'll be watching the I time for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so um, what I wanted to start with, because I just wanted to talk about it for a sec, but we it's not really part of the bigger story sure. so much yet, is, hi, Billy. Welcome Billy, back to NASA. Would someone please give Billy a shower? Or just like... <laughs> Throw some fresh water on his face and get the sand out of his hair. I mean, no, I, I know what they're all just standing around watching yeah, him be it's miserable. Really weird. Well, and then like it seemed like they moved him to another tent or maybe they were just with him for a while. But either way, there was plenty of time to like wash him up a little bit, give him a glass of water. But nobody did that. They just let him, you know, sit there all covered in sand and blood. And I don't know. It just didn't seem very hospitable to me. And I, for one, wish that there had been someone there to kind of mop the poor kid's brow. All right. He's had a hard time. Yeah. Someone maybe other than John Silver. <laughs> That's true. John Silver probably is not the one to think of that sort of thing. No, John Silver's like, hey, let me hide him away. <laughs> you know who would have done it is Gates. Oh, okay. Asked oh, for Liz, did you have to Gates. do that? It broke my heart my note is get gates and then the little you know the emoticon that's got like Aww. the teardrop oh i know so sad. i know i know all right well we're going to have more to say about billy next episode okay we can just be happy he's back and sad for the state that he's in for mm -hmm. now um, but yes this is an exciting episode and i am in favor of getting into it okay well then let's go Okay, well, our parts are very similar to last week. We have our uh, Jack and Max Gen X combo. Um, we again have Eleanor and her dangerous pirates. Mm -hmm. Just a shifting of who the pirates are. And, and then we, I just wrote down Flint and so many people. Yeah. Yep. It's a Flint <laughs> heavy example, episode, which is great. Liz and a James. Is, yes. James McGraw heavy episode as yes, well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have we have James in both of his forms mm -hmm. and him interacting with so many people that we'll just get to that when we get to that. Yeah. Awesome. I'm excited. Okay. I know. Me too. Prepare to board. Hi. Uh, okay. So I thought we'll start again with Jan X, our threesome. And... This time, we start with all three of them cuddled up in bed. We do. Looking really dirty, right? Like super <laughs> filthy, I thought. Not dirty like in the hot kind of way, but dirty in like, wow, hygiene wasn't super great in the 1700s no, sort of way. It's so true. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is good because they could be trying to make it like, you know, super sexy hot. And they didn't. Yes. They made it very realistic. And I liked that look that was shared between Max and Jack. So, yeah, it, yes. it was nice, actually. Um, it is. And, yeah, in general, I just, the same thing that I thought of last episode was just those three are so good at conveying so much without talking to each yes. other. Mm -hmm. That whole first scene. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to note that Anne is cuddled up to Jack. That is true. Yeah, she absolutely is. Mm -hmm. So she's getting what she needs. But she also, you know, we can see that, you know, in the middle of, of her sleeping, we know where she goes for comfort. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which, of course, makes not, sense. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, it just I don't know. It was it's it's uh, yeah, the Jack Ann bit here. I mean, it's so short, but, you know, the knocking happens and then he kisses her on the head. Yeah. Which this is something we're going to see a few times. And it is the most darling thing in the world. I love <laughs> it when he kisses her on the head. So much. I know you've got that gift that you like. I do. Yeah, <laughs> I do. That, that's season three. Yep. There is that gift I love very much because I don't know. Yeah. It's just very adorable. Um, so and then, yeah, like that, that was when I noticed was like when Jack's kind of trying to like fix his hair a little bit. He's. 
I was like, damn, your hair is greasy. Yeah, mister. they're looking pretty gnarly. Well, and all of his <laughs> clothes were all grungy and gross. Yeah, and yeah. yeah it was it was very realistic. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then I actually, um, he comes outside and he talks to Adele for a minute. And I wanted to give, I wanted to give um, the actress who plays Adele her proper dues because I adore her. Isn't she um, great? She is great. She's great. She's just she has every really time you fun see her. costuming too. I think I loved her blue stockings. Oh, oh, I know. And and just and she just wears it all really well. She just she just she really inhabits I was just gonna say that inhabits the role <laughs> yeah yes, I totally so agree much. so I apologize if I'm getting your name wrong but her name uh looks like it's Lise Slabber and okay I adore her yeah really that's, fantastic that's she's say. super cute mm-hmm. I know and I love it when she's like so should I like maybe get some of these people to come indoors when there's all these people milling about <laughs> and um that was just a great little exchange. And but Jack asked her the important question is once he finds out that Flint has a Spanish man of war, he's like, but does he have the gold? Yes. Uh huh. And she doesn't even know, which I think is funny. Yeah, she did not know. But it, I guess it's know. really it doesn't affect her one way or the other. So that makes perfect sense. I mean, that's right. really outside her scope. Right. And that might not have been information. I mean, you know, so far. That's true. You She's know, not the one sure that's privy to information. Max is the one who gets that. She right. has to be taught how to glean information. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. We'll get there in a yes. minute. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, actually, we could go there. So, sure. so the next time we see them, Max is uh, doing, you know, a just perfect act. She... Um, She's talking to Jack. She uh, criticizes the cr- the potential crew members he's found. Right, right. Low hanging fruit. She calls. Them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then I found their their exchange about Anne about their three their threesome situation very interesting. Me too. Um, okay, what were your thoughts about it? I just. Uh, I loved how she blames him. First of all, <laughs> she does. Yeah. Well, which makes sense because. She had, I mean, she was working to to keep Anne in control. It's exactly what she said. Yep. She said, I had yep. her feelings. I had the situation in control. So it did. It threw her for a loop. And so she didn't expect that Anne would have done something, well, that she wouldn't expect. You know, she thought that she had her right. figured out. Now. Exactly. And however, that look on his face when he came in the room was obviously quite confused. <laughs> so, yep. uh, but I did like what she said about how, look, this, this, thing that's happening with the three of us is temporary right she is going to choose at some point and and i i think what she implied there wasn't that she would choose one of them but she would choose her identity with one of them does that make sense oh i like that take on it that was not how i saw it but that totally works yeah yeah. that's great that's what i see is that Anne is not so much choosing between two people that she loves as she is searching for her identity that feels most like her true self and right now max is fairly confident that this new true self will somehow usurp all of this time that she's built up with jack and jack of course knows better he's a little nervous because a lot you can wreak a lot of havoc in the short term. But yes, in the long he's very term, uncomfortable. Yes, yeah. he's uncomfortable with it for sure. But but he's right. They've had such a long history. Yes. So it was very and such, interesting. And such a, such a bound together history. Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, and we see, I mean, that <clears throat> the, the way that they are interacting is already changing like it's yeah. it's really this this ha- this is going to be a big shift for them um and well what I... was the other thing that max said about well okay jack... so the go ahead oh about oh that jack was the one who what the... no about oh. jack's feelings for her oh well she said okay so she said did did you know when she opened the door right like the thing we talked about last week that that Jack thought that Anne was just inviting him to bed, exactly. not inviting him to Max's bed. Right. Mm-hmm. And and he said no. And she said, well, then you must love her very much because you didn't you didn't even look at me the whole night. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> I know better than to look at you, lady. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I did like I liked that a lot. I liked that. Exchange. I didn't realize that she said it that that she was referring to that evening. I thought she was talking about in general, like. Does that make sense? Like you don't look yes, at me. Yes, no, no. So. 
I thought I thought that too until I till today when I rewatched, you know, like really, really, mm-hmm. really paying attention right. and not writing notes. She did actually, I believe, refer to last night, like that you didn't. Okay. I don't remember the wording exactly. I mean, it works both that ways. Makes sense. He's it does, never looked yeah. at her. Well, um, I mean, kind of, yeah. It's back to those circling cats, but <laughs> exactly. But yes, well, and yeah, then you he can't says that, that thing, of course. Right, and then he says that thing about, "Oh, I see you're feeling very indispensable right now." Yes, uh-huh. uh huh. Which she is, uh, yep. both because <laughs> one of my favorite lines of the whole show when he says you know when he's going on about their history and yes he says she's been only with you for a week in your bed and she says you could be amazed what could change in a week in my bed and i believe her i you know <laughs> she's yeah she's uh, the madam of a whorehouse to prove it yes she's yeah, come a long she, way she is a smart lady um mm. but then she does actually prove it to him because he says she says um the thing that she had led with about the crew yes she says well you know she basically hints that there's a lead and yeah and um and then he's like oh there's a lead and she's like yeah but you know who's gonna tell you about telling you yep they're still gonna come to me Mm -hmm. right who's calling me just seemingly indispensable (laughs) right just show you how indispensable i am mister (laughs) smart lady i really like her i adore her and then we get to that awesome scene where they do go up to Adele. Uh-huh. And <laughs> I love and it, Max teaching the art of seduction. It's really oh my great. Goodness. Yeah. And it reminds me a little bit of uh, Inara in Firefly. Only obviously she doesn't have half the class that Inara has. Inara has like ultimate class. However, yes. she's still very smart. Um, and I, I though wonder, what do you think? is Jack's assessment of her little speech on this. What is happening on his face? I love is watching he worrying his face about himself this... or is he worrying about Anne? Oh, I th- I think he's just, no, I think he's honestly just blown away. I mean, I think a door has opened to oh. his understanding of the world. And I think he's just so like. So he's just so impressed by her wiles. He's, I think, I mean, honestly, I think he's blown away. I mean, he won't be the first man uh-huh. nor the last man to be surprised by um, how women sometimes can use sex in ways that men aren't expecting. Let's uh-huh. just put it that way. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and and just right. And then just I guess he knew that she was getting information, but I, I don't know if he ever understood how that was happening exactly. I mean, yeah, unless he just thought, I I mean, he probably just thought, you know, the pirates had loose lips, you know, that they were just (laughs) late at night and drinking their rum and talking to the prostitutes. But he probably didn't think about how they got that information and how they played an active role. That's a good point. Well, and it's very possible. I don't think he gave them any credit. Right. Um, Yes, perhaps he was underestimating them. Yeah, because he even said that, right? That's the last time I underestimate a whore after this week. Yeah, it is. Um, Yes, I think that that was um, was pretty amazing. It's very possible that before the days of Max, you Mm -hmm. know, no, I mean, Adele's clearly hearing the details of how powerful seduction versus fucking his brains out can be. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So this may be, you know, new regime, new tactics, new level of information collecting. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I remember when I watched it the first time, I was just like, Damn. Yes. You just, <laughs> she like, knows that's her art it. form. <laughs> exactly. This is a woman who has perfected an art and mm-hmm. is now teaching her her friend, right. whatever, employee Protégé. Adele, mm-hmm. how to do the same. And then I just, I also adore at the end, and Adele's like, but just to be clear, <laughs> I still fuck his brains out, right? <laughs> oh, Adele. It's, it's, it's a gorgeous scene. I mean, it it's is. just, it's, it's just a perfect scene mm-hmm. from ev- all three of them are completely perfect. Yeah. It's well done. I agree. It is so well done and it pays off. Um, the, then later on when we are back at the brothel, right. Um, Jack sitting around waiting for the fruits of this plan. Mm-hmm. And then is he that has where the, he and Anne have their exchange. Yes. I like that exchange. So, I like that exchange mm-hmm. too very much. So that exchange starts with uh, Anne knowing the plan and saying that Max told her the plan. Yes. Uh-huh. 
And then that's where he says, I've underestimated, underestimated my last whore after yep. the week I've had. After and the then <laughs> yep. she just puts him in his place. She really does. She's, yes. And, and, you know, she's absolutely right. And you can see that recognition dawn on his face, too. Absolutely. That she's right. Yeah. She's like, yes. I have done so much for you without question. And I'm asking you to do this thing. And I love that she she appeals to his care for her because that is, I mean, that's his strongest motivator. So, you know, when she says, I need you to watch my back in that room, because I know I'm not in my right head around her, but as long as you're there, nothing she can do can come between us. Right. And this is just the flip side of that same thing. When he went into the room and made it all about his caring for her. Yes. She's putting the relationship first. She's saying, this is Mm. dangerous. I need you to protect, not just me, protect us. You're protect protecting us. Because she said, yeah. right. Because she said, I know that she, in the state that I'm in, she could play us against each yep. other. And I need you to be the one to make sure that's not happening. Wow. Yeah. And that's it's a just a big appeal. It's a lot to ask of someone. <sighs> it is, but it's so, but it's so appropriate. She's it always is. had his back as the fierce warrior. Yep. And he has her back as the thinker and the feeler and the person who understands relationships. Yes. No, I think you're right. It's so perfect. It's It's really lovely. Yeah. It's very nuanced. We're just going to, this is week three of us just freaking out about how much we love their relationship. It's true. Yeah. They're really fantastic. (laughs) They've grown on me so much because I, again, I I remember the first couple of episodes being like, are they brother and sister? What even is this? Right. Just a weird part. Right. You even said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I really, I, I, I just, there are not many relationships that are, have such a beautiful, strong base as yeah. these two in television. I really just, um, I'm just blown away by them over and over again. No matter mm-hmm. how many times I watch, I'm always moved by them. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so then we have the lovely scene where Max comes down and also one of both of our favorite gifts, like when she grabs the wine or brandy or rum or whatever it is mm-hmm. and sits down to toast. Oh, I don't think that's the gift that we use, actually. But yes, I know what you're talking about. Because uh, it, she's oh, no, it it's a different one. We already passed that oh, one. That's when she first she, becomes right, right, the right. madam. She has the pearls. Yeah. Right, right, right. But right, you're right. right. Either, no, it's OK, though. Either way, yes. The toasting and the coming down the stairs. Very good. Yes. Um, yes, she's it's great. And, the, and she knows when she's she, done something smart and she, she's uh, a little bit smug, but you know, she's, she's a little bit smug. earned it. She has totally earned it, but she also knows how to present it. Like she presents this to Jack. It's she's true. already given Anne something that Anne needs. And now she's giving Jack something that Jack needs. Yeah. And gosh, and, so much more than he expected too. Oh, so much more than he expected. And the thing that really stuck out to me this week when I was watching it was, this is the moment where they become a threesome for real. Like Anne had been getting mm-hmm. something Anne needs. Jack now gets something that Jack needs. And did you notice how Anne circles around? It was we had just had this, you know, kind of tense relation yeah. conversation. Anne circles around, sits down, and what does she do when she sits down? She takes off her hat. She did take in off public. Her hat. Yep. She did. And it was in in relief too right really neat. exactly yeah. yep yeah that actress is like coming alive in those last few episodes too it's absolutely really yes really she lovely. is she yes. looks so different now i know i and know so, so much softer it's wow right and it's this really is neat. when you see how deliberate the way that clara paget kept her face in the beginning yes. and she's still i mean she's fierce she had like she's, a you sneer know, all the time right uh, yeah. Right. And she's still, she hasn't 100% let go of that. No, but that's 100%. the thing is that yeah, you no, managed no, no. to have this. very fierce. Right. She's got this kind of fierce, tough girl face going on. And yet it's so vulnerable at the same yeah, time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I just love this. I mean, this is, this is where, this is where you start to see that, yes, Max is scheming. Yeah. But she's also like actually giving people what they need. Mm -hmm. And I guess I talked about that last week. Like she's getting what she needs by giving people what they need. And that's just great coalition building. Very true. Yep. Um, So, yeah, I think that's everything I had written down. The hat thing. I, I think because of you, because you had been talking about so much about her face hidden. That really struck me this time. 
It is a big part of her character development. I think it's a thing to watch for sure. It is a thing to watch. Mm -hmm. This I can say for sure, thinking about it and having watched a little bit forward and now paying more attention to it. This is something that we should absolutely pay attention to. All right. If you're ready, I'm ready to move on to Eleanor and her dangerous pirates. Okay. Yeah. Boy, she's in a really interesting position in this episode. I mean, because she is stuck right between Flint and Vane. And she has to hide from both of them her allegiance to the other. And she's really questioning her allegiance to each, you know, because, of course, her vision is clouded when it comes to Vane because of her feelings for him. And well, then, and I would argue her vision is clouded sometimes when it comes to Flint as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because she hero worships him in a lot of ways. You know, she exactly. he is the great savior that has come to to make this island what she needs it to be or what she wants it to be. Or, well, he's at least a necessary evil. But no, I, right. I do think, yeah, I, I don't think she would say that. I think that, that she, he, he's the hope. Yes. Mm-hmm. Although less so this week, that's less for sure. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think she's a little bit, yeah. She, I mean, uh, particularly, I think we see that best when she goes to talk to Miranda, actually. Yes. Is when we absolutely. see just how nervous she is about Flint's behavior at this time. Well, and right. And we'll get to that. But she's also very, well, we can talk about that now. I mean, the, the, this threat of Spain um coming and i actually brought this up in an earlier episode thinking we had already gone through this part Mm -hmm. i mean she is downright terrified and for good reason i mean this is a historical thing that spain sacked nassau um during during the war of spanish succession and Mm -hmm. they did they sacked it and that's what she's describing to miranda i mean she's terrified Mm -hmm. legitimately terrified of the threat that's being opened up by the idea of destroying this fort. Yeah. And this is, you know, all scheming, all, all, you know, allegiances aside, she's just really honestly scared. This is going to happen Mm -hmm. again because she experienced it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with her and Vane. I, I keep saying this, that I'm loving their interactions, but this one more than all of the ones before it. Really? Yes. And I'll, I'll say why. Okay. Um, so, okay. Well, we start with like what I'm now calling cranky quartermaster. I still don't know his <laughs> name and I still don't know if he's quartermaster, but I, I found know, myself but writing sure, we'll that down. That. So uh-huh. I'm just going to call him cranky quartermaster now. Um, so, you know, Vane's mad. Cranky quartermaster's mad. Cranky quartermaster is hinting that Eleanor might be the one who gave, um, Flint the information he needed about where to position the the ship. Mm-hmm. Vane gets rid of him. You know, he barks some order at him to go right. check something mm-hmm. so that they can be alone. I'm assuming that's why. I mean, sure, I'm sure he needed to go do what he's doing, but Vane <clears throat> wants to then ask Eleanor this question. Mm-hmm. He says, tell me you had nothing to do with this. Tell me yeah. this wasn't part of the plan that you said before to get me out of this fort. And this is, you know, this is after last night. This is after, you know, mm-hmm. the whole Ned Lowe thing. Um, and and he has his back to her and she says, Charles, look at me. And she's trying to explain. I mean, she's being very rational. I mean, yes, I wouldn't until that point have expected Flint to be so reckless, like yeah. she says, and for Hornigold to be so petty to destroy his own fort. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, t- this is very surprising behavior from both of them, and we'll have to discuss that. And then she has to say it to him again. She says, look at me. Mm-hmm. And he starts to turn, and then he starts threatening her. He starts threatening. He's like, well, I can't get their ship, but I can destroy all the other ships like I uh-huh. said I would. And she says, but you won't. And then he says, what, you doubt me? And she said, no, I trust that you'll be able to come up with a better solution. And And I really liked that. Oh, I know. She shows faith in him, not just as this, you know, out of control pirate, which is what everyone sees him as. But it's a moment where she sees the person Mm -hmm. and his face, the way his face softens when she shows this tiny bit of faith in him. Yeah. I that's love Vane. Yep, I do. It, it, it's true. I think that's one of their best relationship moments that they've had, where you see what their partnership is like. 
because he also or believes can in be. her right. or can be like yeah he does yeah because he believes so much in her and what she can do i mean even to, to the point you know we've said before where he might not actually it, it, it might not be true everything that he thinks right but so so highly of eleanor that he actually gives her power that she doesn't necessarily have but uh but that's when we see how she repays that kindness or whatever you want to call it um right. how she <laughs> has the same kind of respect for him and that he doesn't get anywhere else he doesn't he mm -hmm. doesn't nobody sees him i mean everyone sees him as tough and badass and whatever mm -hmm. but that was a moment where she recognized that he's smart yes mm -hmm. that he's more than i mean again proper pirate we know Definitely. this he's a proper yeah. pirate but for him to have potentially a refuge where he could just be a man also mm. it's hard for you to imagine that that isn't attractive to him i'm sure it is i like that oh yeah i know i know yep that's good so yeah that's why i love this scene so much mm -hmm. i i just it's so subtle i mean of course you know i think his body language had... in this scene is really great too amazing he makes amazing. himself so big when he gets mad he does all these like big yep. broad chest arms out like gorilla stuff and putting his leg up on the wall when he's talking looking yep. out the window yeah but but and the softness and is the so softness subtle i mean it, it would subtle. not work mm -hmm. it wouldn't have worked oh that was it's um oh shoot who asked some one of our one of our listeners asked this week like why did he say i didn't do it for you about oh, Ned Lowe? yeah mm-hmm and I think this is the same thing. Like he can, he can be, have softness towards her, but he can't let it go all the way. He right. has to protect himself. I mean, it's mm -hmm. clear that she had broken his heart already. Right. She had been the one who left him. Yeah. We and I can't imagine that. Story. Yeah. I, I can't so imagine he, that it's easy for him to be vulnerable anyway, let alone after Right. A, after a breakup, after after a heartbreak. Yeah. Well, and immediately afterwards, we see Cranky Quartermaster really challenge him mm -hmm. and well, almost challenge him to the point, you know what I mean? Right. So it's like for him, softness is also, you know, can mean death. I mean, yeah. it's not. Yeah. He's, you know, it's a good point. It's not just he weakness, but it's yeah. Right. So he can't, you know, even with Eleanor, there's only so much that he can allow himself to go down the road of of softening. Um, right. And then we have the thing afterwards where they're walking out and Cranky Quartermaster tells them to stop. And again, proof that his crew does not give a shit about who Eleanor right. Guthrie is. Yeah. She starts doing her Ele Eleanor Guthrie. <laughs> and she's right. She's totally yep. right that any message coming from her would have more impact. Mm hmm. Um, but Cranky Quartermasters, he says something like, you should be quiet now, miss. Like, none oh, of the I respect she usually wow, gets. yeah. He, and that's when Vane just turns on him. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, a body language thing. Like, the Quartermaster was higher up on the steps. Uh-huh. And Vane was below him. And he says, do you have a problem? Challenge me. Mm -hmm. Fight me. Yeah. Ugh, and Vane. <laughs> I know he can stand like a head and a half below a taller man yeah and still intimidate the shit out of him it's so awesome yep I he's know. a cool character <laughs> and again Zach McGowan just killing it yep every single time mm -hmm. um so the next thing I wanted to talk about I know this is supposed to be Eleanor and her and her pirates but I just wanted to bring up quickly the exchange between Vane and Abigail Ash Oh, when he yeah. goes in to get the letter. Um, that was interesting. I really Wasn't liked Abigail. And I keep on trying to put my exactly. finger on why I like her immediately. She's immediately, very interesting. Right? Vulnerable, but strong, honest. Exactly. I like, you know, her interaction with the bread tells a lot about her character. Right. I think. Didn't yeah. it? Yeah. She's, she's interesting. I just like her. I like her too. I know. I had the same reaction when I first watched that I mm -hmm. liked her immediately. And part of it is like she's she goes instantly from cowering from what she had learned from being with Ned Lowe's crew. Right. To when he says, I cut off his head. She says, good. Right. Yeah. See, I didn't even do that right. She says it with such it fierceness. Awesome. Yeah. But a quiet fierceness, like the fierceness that yeah. is completely appropriate to someone who's, you know, a young girl, but had gone through a horrible ordeal. Right. Mm hmm. 
but but you see there that she still has kept her spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the, I have a but I have a question for you. Sure. This this is a part I'm still working on. Okay. So when he's talking to her about her father and she doesn't know what he's you know what his work you know how yeah. how much money he has and this mm-hmm. and that, and then he says, um, "Are you close to him?" And she didn't understand the question. Right. And he said, he said, basically, you know, will he pay for your life? Mm-hmm. And then she says, oh, are you asking if he loves me? Mm-hmm. And I felt like that, you know, Vane pauses for a second at that. Well, and then, I mean, you know, they... Vane's an orphan slave. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So that part I understand. The part that I have a theory about, but is interesting to me. So, you know, they go through the details of the letter and that's mm-hmm. all taken care of. But then the show chooses when he walks out to have him close the door and have us watch him react for a few seconds before we move on to the next thing. Oh, uh-huh. And, I, you know, I feel like he went through a lot of emotions in those seconds. Mm-hmm. And so my question is... Do you feel like Vane is uncomfortable with what he's doing? Oh, that's a good question. I think he's certainly unsure. I mean, this is not his typical gig, you know? Right. I think that that more than anything, I think is what's making him nervous. And also he has that he has that guard dog protector thing in him too. Mm-hmm. He he doesn't like. I think it's oh. clear that he does not like the way that she was treated aboard Nedlow's crew. Right. And I think it I think he liked that, you know, when she said good, mm-hmm. that Ned Lowe he did like I, that. Yeah. And he had, I mean, not only thought that, that it was neat of her to say so, but neat is a silly word, but anyway, <laughs> but also that he had kind of a sense of pride of being a, mm-hmm. a deliverer. And right. so he is probably questioning a little bit, like, is this, is this who I want to be? Is this what I want to do? Right. Yeah. That's what I thought. I, and I felt like, you know, again, with his his background as a slave, like this isn't exactly human oh. trafficking, but it isn't exactly not human yeah. trafficking. Yep. It's a very gray area, isn't it? Yeah. I, yeah. So that's Especially what for struck someone me. who holds freedom at such a high price, right? It has so much respect exactly. for freedom. That's exactly. That's a really good point. Um, and I, I, again, this is another thing just doing a podcast is the best thing about a show you love because you notice every little thing yeah, all those details. whether you can answer every question or not you notice so much more mm-hmm. um i it just really struck me that you know this man who we just saw him you know stand up to the quartermaster and be such a badass and he was a badass when he was in the room with her yeah. because he's very good at pirate theater you know this mm-hmm. is definitely yeah you know he won't he wouldn't show her that yeah. but when he's alone He's just, he just, yeah, conflicted was mm-hmm. just what came to my mind. And I was curious what your thoughts about it were before I said mine. Yeah. So, no, I think that's yeah. right. I think Fair. we also learned something that we had uh, talked about and joked about, and that Zach McGowan had joked about on Twitter, which is that oh, right. I don't think Charles Vane can write. Nope. He would have written it right. himself, which means somebody right. else did have to write down, I angered Charles Vane. Yep. So interesting. Good to know. And when I did, if anyone didn't catch it, we did put in the uh, in the show notes for last week. We I, uh, we put the link for the for that cute oh, Twitter good, conversation good. between I'm between glad. Zach McGowan I and, and uh, Toby Schmidt, so that awesome. everyone can enjoy it as much as we did. Okay, so that's uh, I think that closes. We don't get a whole lot of vein this time. Um, it's true. So we, we really can, don't. Yeah. Uh, we can move on to uh, Eleanor and Flint and their interactions. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so yeah, the next thing she does is she rows out, rows or is rowed out to right. the Spanish warship, and um, she brings Vane's uh, reply to the ultimatum right. that now we know is being read out to the to the street. I love I love that term. I love I love how they talk. This is I feel like when they start really using that term, the street, to yes. talk about the people of Nassau. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I really enjoy this. This is where I start turning against Horn and Gold a little bit. He's really annoying in this episode. Yes, I like yeah. that when Flint 
reads this, he's like, everyone out. And Horner goes like, I deserve to offense like everyone. Yes. I don't remember what he says. Give us like, the room is what he right. says. Oh, he says, give us the room. Which is right. one of my favorite I'm... quotes from this show. I just think it's the most <laughs> badass thing to say when you want to talk to somebody. Just give us the room. <laughs> Excuse right. me? Ex- yep. Yep. It's very of course, cool. Of course, Flint uses it. Of course he does. <laughs> Naturally. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, and no consideration for whatever Hornigold thinks is owed to no. him, at least Mm-mm. at this one moment. Um, and so, right, he reads it. And again, now we've got both sides using this, you know, anti-pirate propaganda yeah. words to describe the other. Now they're calling Flint the madman on the water. <sighs> and then we have this exchange between Flint and Eleanor. <laughs> which is hard it's a hard one like neither of them's admitting anything really right. mm-hmm. um and you know and eleanor what does she say she says he says that she that vane's not capable of this so exactly right. showing what everyone thinks of vane uh-huh. which we just saw vane so although do you think that, that she helped him come up with this plan i mean she had to yes. right yeah yes yes she did yeah yes yeah, I yes, I totally mm. do. Um, I think that um, when she said that to Vane, she was recognizing that Vane was willing to accept her better plan yes. mm-hmm. <laughs> more than come up with his own necessarily. Yeah. Um, and then she says, were I helping him, what would it say about the trust we're supposed to share? Yep. I like she that kind little of dance. Admits it. Yep. She does yeah, kind of admit it. Yep. She does a little bit admit it. And then she gets all mad at him. I've done all this stuff for you. I can't believe you're doing this. And he says, look, I understand that this is really a dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's most interesting to me is that there's a basic misunderstanding here. Is that Eleanor comes there with the intention of figuring out a way for Flint and Vane to survive this. Yes. Flint says to her look I don't care he if care. he yeah. right I don't care if Vane chooses to give up the fort mm-hmm. it's very he true. will give up the fort yep, he one doesn't way or the care other. if Vane dies mm-hmm. he probably would be excited if Vane died uh, yeah one less thing to he, worry he doesn't about say that. Sure. he doesn't say it but exactly yeah. he does say um, that you and I did not see Charles Vane in the same light basically or something like that exactly yeah so, so this is, I feel like, a furthering of what happened last week with Flint and Eleanor, mm-hmm. is that Eleanor had come in with this basic assumption that she could fix this by getting everyone to be reasonable. Yeah. And Flint's just like, yeah, this isn't, you know, we're, we don't actually have the same goal here. Right. Their, yeah. their interests are not actually aligned in this moment. Mm-hmm. And I think in his eyes, she's not looking at the big picture, that the big picture we know what Flint's big picture goal right. is. Mm-hmm. And Vane is just an impediment to that. Yeah, And I don't know. We, we will have to discuss how we feel about Flint's decisions here. I, I, I'm still very conflicted, to be honest. Yeah. But we don't have to go there yet. Well, I'm kind of um, on Team Miranda with this episode when it comes to Flint. I mean, I love what she said to Eleanor when she's like, you're encouraging his violence. You're enabling him feeding into absolutely. these delusions. I don't know if she said that, but that's what's happening. She didn't say that. I don't right. think she said that. The other two things she said, but either way, but I felt her frustration then because now we're seeing this James character who, right. uh, you know, is maybe a little bit pretentious, maybe a little bit tightly buttoned up. However, was, you know, not a manic murderer either. <laughs> and no, I mean, as much as we love Flint... Silver was right. We haven't gotten to that. But when he's like, the things you've done. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, uh, All right. Well, maybe we should move on to Flint, Flint now. I mean, we don't sure. have to go. Yeah. I mean, Miranda puts her in her place. And you said mm-hmm. the most important part of this. And we already had talked about, you know, Eleanor's fears. So I say let's move on to Flint. Let's do it. Mm, <laughs> this is Flint. what I've been waiting for. I know. There's so much to talk about with Flint. Okay. Where, <sighs> well, where, where do you want to start? Okay. Well, again, I feel like it's very important with the Flint storylines in yeah. this portion of our show to to go the way in the order that things happen in the show, because I think there's a okay. lot of significance of in the choices of they make. Yes. 
So I will guide you through this again. Okay, good deal. Okay. So we start out um, in what I've been calling, what I guess in my notes I started calling the war room. When we have, you know, Flint and Hornigold and Silver always in the background. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, and, and they're ship, talking though, about... Right? I mean... What? I said that ship, though, right? When they're oh. in there? Oh, I know. It is and so And did you notice cool. there were many hammocks in there now? I did. Flint did yep. put the vanguard he in there. He did put the vanguard in there. I did notice. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. They fold up those hammocks during the day when he needs it, yep. but we know who's sleeping there. Um, so, okay. So, you know, they talk about Bane and that there's been defectors. And so Flint assigns everyone's jobs. He tells Hornigold to go talk to the captains and, and he says, and I'll go to the beach. And then everyone leaves. And this interaction between Flint and Silver is so significant. Mm -hmm. So let's linger. Okay. Um, (laughs) if you don't mind. Not at all. Um, so, so Silver, uh, reaffirming our ideas of their partnership yeah not an even partnership he no. says when you say you'll go to the beach i'm assuming you mean i will <laughs> uh-huh. although he doesn't argue that yeah he just gets no. up to go he's like okay right right he doesn't argue and nor does flint even bother to to, to affirm say yeah. yes <laughs> right he just <laughs> yeah but there's a huge shift in this there scene. Is. a huge shift huge mm-hmm. huge when Silver's walking away, Flint says, why do you think they're going up that hill? And he means going to go join right. Bane at the fort. Mm-hmm. And, and Silver is so surprised. I love that. Sorry. Are you asking my opinion? <laughs> and then we get that look from Flint, that eat shit and die look. Right. <laughs> but yes, I am but asking fl- your opinion. Yes, mm-hmm. but Flint gives us many looks. So, does, okay, so yeah. the surprise was in a, in addition to being adorable is important because we now know that this is the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Fl- I mean, Silver's been pushing his opinions at Flint from mm-hmm. day 1. Right. But we know now that this is the first time he asked. And then, you know, he like kind of scrambles to put some theories together. Right. And then he says, um Perhaps they're just expressing their opinion of you. Hmm. And that's when Flint asks, do they see me as the villain villain. in this story? Mm. Because it's all about stories. It's all about how the story's told. Gosh. And it's so funny because, of course, he's been crafting this character that's so villainous in so many ways, but never to Nassau. He never wanted to be right. a villain to Nassau. He always, no. I mean, that's so important to be a hero. In his Right. In his mind, he's always been doing this in, in the name of being the savior the of savior Nassau. The savior of Nassau. Absolutely. Oh. But we get this big revelation. Hey, hey, because son of a carpenter. <laughs> I knew it was going to come up. I knew that was going to be yep. a thing. But he does. He has yep. a savior complex. He does. Ooh. He does. He does. And we're about to learn there why. There it is. Wow. So Silver says, well, yeah, that would explain their decision if they see you as a villain. Mm-hmm. And then Flint's face softens. Yeah. yeah. At this point in the com For Flint. For Flint. Yeah. For Flint. It definitely shifts. <laughs> we'll can, put it that yeah, way. You have to grant me. You have to grant me for, yes. for, for, for James Flint. Mm-hmm. We know that that. You know, James McGraw is Dimples McGraw, but James Flint, mm-hmm. we have seen nary a dimple up until now. No, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> nary a dimple. <laughs> Hashtag nary a dimple. <laughs> I like it. And then he says, what do you think? And again, he doesn't quite smile, but his face softens. Mm-hmm. Like he's actually asking Silver. He's right. That's what I mean is he's not... He, he, it's he sincere. takes the mask off mm-hmm. for a second. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. what I mean. And Silver gives him the answer of, for me, you are what I've always said you are. You are the agent of getting me my gold. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I don't care what everybody else then, says. <laughs> exactly. I, I like that says, about Silver. Silver doesn't change, or at least he hasn't yet in, right. in that way. No, he hasn't mm-hmm. yet. Um. And then Silver, I think Silver honestly thought that that was going to be a satisfying answer for Flint. 
Because that's the answer Silver would have wanted for yeah. himself. He would have wanted the answer of, you are the person who's most useful for me reaching right. my goals. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we are... Simpatico. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. But he, but Silver, being the perceptive person he is, he says, wait a minute. Yeah. You're not at all happy with my answer. And he says, what do you think? And that's when he comes to this realization. The realization that... I this I remember so clearly when I first watched Me it. Too. This realization broke my heart to no end because we kind of know this about Flint up until now. Like we always suspected we that suspected he cared, it. Mm-hmm. but this is when like Silver confirms it for us mm-hmm. that he sees in Flint that he cares. Yeah, that this matters to him, and that that oh my God, exactly what Silver said that you care about what people feel about you and yet you've done what you've done. Mm -hmm. It must be horrible to be you. Is that what it says? Or it must be awful being you? Yes. It must be awful being you. Yep. And the look on Flint's face after that, I mean, he has Uh. turned to stone. The mask is like layered on Mm -hmm. five times after that. Uh. And this is, I feel like at a really important moment. I mean, Flint had been opening up to silver. I mean, this was the most open. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we saw in the past two episodes that Flint saw a partner in Silver. Yeah. Yep. And we're about to transition. I will take us now the transition. What par- to remind us what partnership looks or looked once upon a time, yes. James McGraw. Yes. So our transitions are fascinating. We have two sound effects that we have in our transitions. Oh, okay. We have a clock The clock ticking, ticking for sure, was very and effective. thunder. Oh. We have a clock. I didn't notice the thunder. we have a storm. Mm-hmm. Oh. These are our two sounds that through all of our flashbacks. Civilization because all and of our chaos, flashbacks, huh? Civilization and nature. Yeah. I guess that's really what it is. Yeah. Civilization versus the nature well, of man or, or nature. Well, okay. and also, yes, it mm-hmm. is definitely that, but also... Time, time's ticking. We have, yeah. we have, you know, we have a goal. We have things that we need to get to yep. in this episode. Time is not on their side. Right. At the, by the end, mm-hmm. I'll just jump ahead a little. Time's not on their side because when Alfred Hamilton turns against them, they're Ugh. talking about how he's going to immediately yes. go and try to turn people against them. And you notice... I won't go too far into the future because I really do want to stick to structure. Mm-hmm. But it was, I noticed very distinctly at the when they're meeting with the people that Thomas Hamilton thinks will be his allies, mm-hmm. he's wearing the same coat he was at dinner. Oh, this is the same night. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Well, he said that he said that his father was coming in shortly. Yeah. No. 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 I'm saying after the father leaves. When he's me- when oh, he has all of his salon people, it's yes. the same night. Oh, time is I not see. on their yeah. side. Okay, and now I see that. Okay, and the storm, obviously, you know, obvious, ominous, right? You know, and they actually even like give us a few like thunders at very appropriate moments. Right. For <laughs> ominous <laughs> exclamation point of ominousness. <laughs> um, okay, so we go straight from Flint reacting to Silver. Mm-hmm to hearing the clock ticking and and then um we see was that when James come oh no sorry I missed a transition because I was so excited about talking about uh to talk about silver that I missed our first transition sorry first clock ticking was after um they were talking with Hornigold in the beginning um and Hornigold and they were talking about how to rebuild the the fort once it was yes. once it was destroyed, which Flint only seemed to be the only one who was concerned about that. Hornigold's just on the warpath. Mm-hmm. So sorry, our first bit with James and Thomas was uh, James shows up and and greets Miranda and said that he heard Thomas had said something urgent, mm-hmm. and Miranda assures him that it had nothing to do with her with the two, with of, the them. two of them. Right, mm-hmm. right. He's still nervous about Thomas- that, even though she's had this reputation right (laughs) yes um and then thomas says he's arriving in two hours that's where our time stamp was was, that was our first reference to time Mm -hmm. and i i was so fascinated by the way he introduced his his father because he says 
many titles that I'm not going to list because I didn't write them down and they're uh-huh. too many to remember. But it was like title, 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 my father. Oh, I thought he was listing different people and his father, oh, no. which makes sense why there was only one person at dinner. Oh, my gosh. Right. Wow. All of those titles. Uh. He is just, which for me was just like, did two things. I mean, mm-hmm. it already introduced us to this idea that Thomas and his father don't really get along. No, quite not. Like yes. the last way that Thomas sees his father is as his father right. after all of those titles. Mm-hmm. And also, I just felt like every one of them was just a beating drum of like civilization, civilization, oh, civilization, 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 my father. Ah, yep. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And then he says, <laughs> and then I just love that exchange where he says, well, he's like, Flint's like, okay, well, we'll give him our plan. He's like, well, there's the one part that you and I are yet to discuss. Uh-huh. It's like I didn't Jesus. think there was anything we hadn't discussed. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. He's like, seriously? Mm-hmm. <laughs> How many hours can we sit in your office and right. not have covered everything? Yep. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, it went okay. out of order a bit. Back into order. Now, after Silver, we again have the yeah. clock. Well, tick, but then tick, he tick. also says then, I, I want to point this out too. That's when he says, sure, sure. I want you to talk me out of it. Oh, no, that's actually in this one. Oh, is this it? Is- Oh, no, you're right. That was the talk. Oh, yeah. I'm just messing it up all over no, the place. No, you're okay. You're right. That but he says, I want you to talk it, me out of it. Yeah. Such a great line. It is a great line. Yeah. Because and it is, again. And, well, what do you think he meant when he said that? I want you to talk me out of it. Well, I, I think it, well, for me, it meant a few things. Okay. I mean, it, one, I think that was also where he said, I've come to trust you. Very much. And oh, uh-huh. so yes. part of the talk me out of it, I mean, this is just something you would do with a friend. I mean, if you want to do a crazy thing. Yeah. So like be a sounding like, bo- Well, okay. Yeah. Not even a sounding yeah, board. Yeah, exactly. But, okay. But, but you're like, be, be the person who helps me through this process is yeah. what he's saying. Give me some counsel. Give me, let me filter it through you. Right. And this is a continuation of the whole strange pairs thing is mm-hmm. like, I have this wacky idea. The beauty of our partnership is that we are so different. So, yes, you know, please help. You know, I want I need you to help me with this. Mm-hmm. Like, I think he's recognizing that it might be insane. Yeah. What he's wanting to do. Mm-hmm. What were your thoughts about it? Well, it was one of two things. It's either that he is truly fearful of his father and that he might lose everything at this point and is saying oh, if he is. yeah if i am absolutely off my rocker please tell me so i don't go any further but secondarily i think some of it might have been help me you know think of arguments against this that i haven't yet formulated an answer to because every argument against it i'm about to hear for sure right which so is a perfect combination because, of those right mm-hmm. and then flint does yeah. Did you notice sure that yeah. every single thing, so I keep calling him Flint, every single thing that James says mm-hmm. as an argument against it yep. is exactly what Alfred ends up saying. That's very true. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The exact, exact same, same thing. Things. Yeah. They'll call him a coward and yeah. And right. Treason and, that, right. and traitors. Yep. All of it. Exactly. That people who want to pardon traitors are, are traitors themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Right. And I, I just love when they start the conversation that that Thomas says that, you know, everything's going to be judged on my approach to the pirates. And James is like, well, it's great because we have this great war strategy and we're going to do our war strategy and then we're going to hang them all. And Thomas is like, well, no. Yep. Actually. <laughs> that's that's the part that I wanted to talk to you about, actually, Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <are> now <laughs> oh, now we're calling him. Jimmy Dimples McGraw, is that what we've done to our to our fierce pirate? <laughs> oh dear. Um and this is one of the use of thumb of uh, thunder. He says he says, I want to pardon them. Thunder. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Nature nature as exclamation point. Um and then the, I I love this exchange where Thomas says they're men. And James says, they're traitors to the crown. Yep. And Thomas says, what difference does it make? And James says, well, it makes a big difference to the crown. Uh, mm-hmm. And he's just, he's doing it. He's doing the back and forth and the back and forth. And 
I just, um, yeah, I just, the shift then that we see James have, um, he goes from saying, what does he say? As, as your liaison uh, to the Admiralty, I would say ad- use extreme caution. As your friend, I would say, forget you ever thought yeah. of this. Because mm-hmm. he says, I know who your father is. I yeah. know that this is, you are, you are stepping into dangerous ground, my friend. He wants to protect him. Yeah. He and does. And protect his reputation. He wants to protect- and, yeah. Right. So then we get to, after um, other stuff happen and a little bit more of Hornigold, uh, just being boring. I'm sorry. He just, Hornigold really annoys me during this. He's just like. He's really stodgy. He's just, like, he's just stodgy and he's stuffy. Really stodgy a little and pretentious just, and yeah. Well, and he's just, he's just so on the warpath. Like he won't think about anything except revenge right yeah, now. And yeah. so it's just like, he's droning, droning. And I think I wrote at some point, Liz, I was like, we keep having these things where we go from Hornigold talking to like fading into the past. And it's uh-huh. like, Yeah. If I was Flint and I had to listen to Hornigold, I'd start <laughs> thinking about my past too. I would definitely drift off into yep, thinking about the past. Tune that out. That's funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then we have this dinner with uh, with Alfred Hamilton, <sighs> where he does he says exactly the arguments that James had laid out. Mm. Exactly, but you know, way meaner and oh, he's more the vicious worst, and, right? And the worst, the worst. wig ever. Yep. He is the worst. Ugh, he is the worst. He's awful. Yes, I really, 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 really dislike him. And right. And so he starts out talking to his son and then he's just like, whatever. I'm just going to talk to this, you know, to to our lieutenant mm-hmm. here. And really and, tries to put him, uh, t- to push him against Thomas. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's just so interesting because, you know, it's not like I didn't feel like James in the earlier scene was was using his arguments at, to be devil's advocate. I mean, I think that's what he really believed. It, yeah, and, it seems so to And me. yet, when it comes down to it, and he sees Alfred Hamilton disrespecting his friend. Yes, both of his and friends. Then, yeah. And then disrespecting Miranda. Yeah. That was the moment where he stands up. When, yeah. when Alfred says, what, you've done enough damage to this family, I'd thank you to keep your mouth and your legs closed. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that's awful. the moment that James shoots up. Yep. And this is the same thing we have in that tavern is when somebody yes. speaks ill of Miranda Hamilton. Mm-hmm. That's the moment where James acts not quite judiciously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he didn't go and punch Alfred Hamilton no, as much as it, that yeah, would have been satisfying he, he for kept us. He it together as much as he could, although he did. I love when Thomas was like, did you just command my father out of his own home? <laughs> Yes, it was glorious, uh-huh. glorious. Yes, oh, um, but what he said was so wonderful. When he's like, "I don't care what people say about you. You are a good man, and somebody should defend that." Yes, Gosh. that's what he says. Oh, um, and before that, he what he says to Alfred Hamilton is he says he says uh, in the end, "I support him. Yeah. I find his argument persuasive. I find his intent to be good and true." And I find yours wanting, sir. Yeah. Well, and I love you. Like, what? Sorry. I was going to say I love Thomas's argument when when he was saying, yeah, he 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 was arguing for Christ likeness. He was saying, you know, we're in this war to put a Protestant on the throne because we want to be more like Christ. And here you're saying not to give, not to offer forgiveness to. Yep. Yeah. That, it's a great argument. It was a great argument. Yeah. One that we're still having today. It's a timeless yes. argument. Yeah. It is true. Hello, yes. Trump. Um, what? We, we could we could use we could use more we could use more Thomas Hamiltons in our lives. Absolutely. Um, and um what did I want to say? Oh yeah. Uh, but I do feel like, you know, James his honor, his his um his need to defend yeah. righteousness is what inspired him because up until that moment when Alfred Hamilton had been so horrible, he was being practical. He was. He was saying the same things, yeah. but he was moved in that moment. And I feel like this is so significant. I mean, this is the moment where James McGraw realigned himself. Yes. It had been a process. Mm-hmm. 
but this is where he realigned himself. And the thing that's most striking to me, back to the conversation with Silver, is that what he said to Thomas about you being a good man and someone should defend that, mm-hmm. um, that's what he needed from Silver and he didn't get it. Oh. Silver said the exact opposite, basically. Silver oh, said, course. I don't care Daphne. if you're a good man. I don't care if you're a good man. You're going to meet my material needs, yeah. but not, but nothing about, nothing about righteousness, nothing about, oh. about spiritual goodness, and about morality. He can't get morality. that from Miranda anymore because he's pushed her so far away. Oh, that's tragic. Leave it to me. Right. To bring added levels of tragedy <laughs> oh, to Black man. Sales. But this is the thing. This is where, this is where these two scenes that have so many similarities, Mm -hmm. really just, I feel like that's it. Yeah. Like, for me, this was the moment where Flint was laid bare. This is where I knew. We knew, you know, we knew he had a goal. We knew he felt, you know, he had the whole Odysseus thing. Right, right, of course. The the ore to shovel thing. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this is the moment where we understand where it started yeah. like like Miranda said this is where we know this is the moment this is the moment where Flint sorry not Flint <laughs> where James McGraw where James McGraw committed himself to being the defender of Thomas Hamilton's mm-hmm. dream wow yep you're absolutely right this is the moment yep who this is why I was so excited about this episode yeah. this this for me was was what sealed it like my love for Flint as we know as I've said many times started in the very first moments of the very first episode Mm -hmm. but this is where it took on a new layer because we all you know there was always this question of why he was doing what he's doing and we can still discuss whether he's doing it right Mm -hmm. and that's a big discussion that we should continue to have but now we know why Mm -hmm. wow and his the source of it was goodness. Yes. The source of it goodness is something. Goodness and righteousness. Who would have thought? Absolutely. The yeah. source of, of all of his actions, again, whether or not he's, you know, and I think I'm not spoiling anything now to say, you know, Miranda did say last season, he wouldn't want you to do this. Like, yeah, yeah. We this have is the not question. what Thomas know, would have wanted. Yep. Right. And she just said he back then. Right. But, you know, yeah. we knew, we know his time. And now we, you know, there's no way it could be anything, but mm-hmm. we know, we know who Flint had aligned himself to mm-hmm. back then and had committed himself as the defender. Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, so that's why, I mean, I really think, you know, we, what I had said about the flashbacks being Flint's thoughts mm-hmm. is that. I think he had started to see in Silver possibly something approaching something with some similarity to the partnership yeah. he had with Thomas, where he would be the Thomas because he's the one with the larger goal. Mm-hmm. But Silver just showed him that he can't at this point be that person. Yeah. So, yep. Mm. <sighs> Our poor Flint. He's no Gates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, well, and Gates couldn't have been that person either. Not I at mean, this stage, but I think he was for a while. Yeah. He was, but he never knew the full story. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing. How can you really be the defender of a vision yeah. if you don't really know that vision? Yeah, it's very true. And, you know, and that's part of what we can discuss about Flint is that if you don't, you know, Thomas had this openness. Thomas allowed Flint in. Mm-hmm. Thomas was clear about his motives. Thomas yeah. and, and a whole drawing was, room full of people, in fact. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. Thomas Thomas was not ashamed to say what he wanted, even though he knew it was controversial mm-hmm. and maybe dangerous. Right. And Flint, once he became Flint, was never capable of of that kind of partnership. Yeah. Of allowing someone in the way that Thomas let James in. And that might be part of the problem. Yeah. Wow. I like that. Mm-hmm. We will continue to discuss this. <laughs> this is just the beginning, everyone, of us discussing 
this of the continuation of who is James Flint and why. Yes. Um, so the last conversation, the last scene with Flint um, is his with Scott. Um, yeah. And I, I, I was very touched by this scene. Mm-hmm. He, um, yeah, he really showed a lot of honor to and, and respect to Scott. Honor and respect that was completely due to him. Yeah. I loved what he said. Like he said the, he called him the man behind two thrones. Yeah, that's right. And he mm-hmm. recognized that 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 most people weren't aware mm-hmm. of that place that Scott had held, that yeah. Scott had essentially held Nassau together mm-hmm. and helped Nassau pro- prosper. Right. Um, and, you know, and Scott, conti- you know, Scott, in a way, was kind of offering to be that for him, to be the voice of wisdom, yes. the voice of. And he said, you know, even if. Even if Eleanor's judgment isn't perfect about Vane, that doesn't mean she's wrong about right. what she's fighting for right mm-hmm. now. And I agree with him. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, um, right. And he says, he's like, look, and Flint had even brought up to Hornigold how scary it is to destroy the fort when he knows that the Scarborough yeah, is, is right there. nearby. Yeah. And that and that Spanish soldiers had just watched him take a Spanish yep. ship. Like he had already set up exactly the dangers that Scott brought up at the end of the mm-hmm. episode. Mm-hmm. And Scott said, "If we fight each other, we're going to do everyone's work for them. Yeah. We need to work together." Mm-hmm. And yet, Flint goes down those stairs, and when Hordenkold pesters him again. He seems defeated about him. He seems so miserable, and yet he says fire. He does. Ready to guns! Full compliment! All right, Liz. Yeah. What's your thesis statement? Okay, mine seems a little bit... Well, I mean, you have to think of it in the full context, but mine is the, I want you to try to talk me out of it. I think that's oh. why he says fire then with that look that he has on his face is because like it's like when you have this plan and this is my great plan and there are so many things that could go wrong, you know, but I want you to, to, to talk me out of this thing I can't get out of my like I can't get it out of my chest. I can't get it out of my heart. Like my gut tells me to do this thing, but my mind's saying, what the hell are you thinking? So Flint's doing that. Thomas Hamilton is doing that. I think it's also what's happening with Anne. I think she tells Jack, I want you to talk me out of it. Like I need you in that room. So that's the one I'm going to for thesis statement. That's a good argument. Well, and even Eleanor and Vane. When Eleanor says to Vane, I think you can come up with a better plan than this. Oh, man, that is not my thesis, David. And you <laughs> just totally made a great. All right. I'm going to say mine. Okay. I don't know now because I really like yours. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I pretty much laid out what the reasoning for mine, but I think it's what uh, James said. People can say what they like about you, but you're a good man. More people should say that and somebody should be willing to defend it. Hmm. And again, so there's the question, is my thesis statement more a thesis statement for the show than for the episode? I think it is for the show and not for the episode. Yeah. Okay. Because it's definitely accurate. lay out my thinking. But maybe right. not for this entire episode. Yeah. Okay. Let me lay out my thinking. Sure. And now, and then we'll decide. My thinking was that everything that James is doing is basically what he believes is him defending that he uh-huh. is okay. defend that i mean basic i mean this is why i'm saying the whole show like basically up until now you could argue that everything james has done mm-hmm. has been in defense of the idea yeah. that thomas is a good and righteous man and that mm-hmm. his plan was the right plan mm. But this episode in particular seems that way for me because James is so single mindedly focused on this idea of 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 making Thomas's plan become reality that he's willing. And we've seen this before, but in in particular in this episode, he's willing to sometimes overlook the smart thing of the moment for the sake of the greater plan. Yeah. 
Hmm. I know. Hmm. And I like that. I do. Yeah. And see, and the same thing you said about the pairs of people, this idea of defending someone else mm-hmm. is also works mm-hmm. for Vane and Eleanor and for Jack <laughs> and Anne. <laughs> yeah. I think I like yours better. I mean, I think I like oh, yeah? mine. My, I think I was, I think I was biased because, because this, that statement of yeah. James's is so moving to me and mm-hmm. is so meaningful for me and for my, and for my, it's so meaningful for my love of this show mm-hmm. that I might have been blinded to yeah. other possibilities <laughs> because of it. Fair. Um, Cause this is one of the moments mm-hmm. I had been waiting yeah. for weeks to talk about mm-hmm. so it's very possible that I was blind I like yours I'm gonna go with yours okay well I'll take it sure <laughs> um, we'll see if anybody else got it It was a random one so I'd be really surprised if anybody else did oh I don't know if it is random you don't think I so feel like it's so it's, s- it's so significant yeah. it's so it's so important to who Thomas is yes so the thing that I wanted to really bring up at the end here um that is relevant to both of our thesis statement theories Mm -hmm. is um, a bias I've had, which I think is a correct bias, but it has been a bias towards thesis statements for this segment of season two to always have been from the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct for the thesis statements, but I wanted to go into why I think that's significant. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I waited until this episode to bring this up because this is the episode that I feel like really unlocked the idea that everything we've ever seen James do really is based in his past experience that we're now seeing. Mm -hmm. Um, And the idea why the thesis statements need to be in the, in from the past is that the past is shaping the present. Yes, definitely it is. Mm -hmm. Um. And that's because Flint is shaping the present. Like like Miranda said last episode about him being a person who can kind of make make things happen yeah. and shape things. Mm-hmm. Um, and f- I believe that Flint is shaping the present according to this pact, this, this commitment that he made in the past at this moment that we just witnessed. Mm-hmm. And part of why he's the one who shapes the present is something I think I said in just impromptu. I said in first in the first season was that everyone's doing stuff, right? Everyone's like living in their their day to day reality mm-hmm. of NASA. And that doesn't mean that they're not planning. I mean, obviously, Eleanor and Max and Jack are all people who are planning and, you know, can see a, a large field of of people and actors and consequences, but they're all still existing just within the reality of NASA Mm -hmm. now. And Flint already showed us from the very first episode that he's aware of a larger world. He's aware Mm -hmm. of civilization and England and the Scarborough and the consequences. And now we know why Mm -hmm. he was there when this question of what should happen with the right. pirates of NASA was discussed from the position of civilization. Mm-hmm. So I think I compared that back then. And if I didn't, I will now to the idea of like of a being that exists in two dimensions and a being that exists in three dimensions, mm-hmm. like the rest of them are just existing on the ground yeah. in their reality mm-hmm. of NASA. And Flint is the one who's actually seeing the past and the present and all these factors outside of, and this was such a great juxtaposition in this episode of Hornigold. So focused on his one little issue, Mm -hmm. his one thing and, and that, and how dangerous it is to just be focused on your personal vendetta or, or whatever affects you in the moment. Mm -hmm. He's not looking in the long term. Flint Like Eleanor obviously can look a little bit longer term and larger. Yeah. Flint's aware of all of it, including the past, Mm -hmm. including the thing that set all of this in motion in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And the, what was I trying to say? 
this relates to what I've been saying all along about Flint being a man alone. Uh huh. Is it yeah. in a way like yes, Miranda's aware of the past, mm-hmm. but she's less aware of what's actually going on in NASA. Right. Yeah. She's Flint's not proactive the now. Only, mm-hmm. Right. Flint's the only person who's kind of existing on all of these planes at the same time. Mm-hmm. And just the amount of loneliness, like that's the thing. This is why I felt like it was so crushing when Silver said what he said, because Flint has been we- has been carrying this burden mm-hmm. all this time, yeah. and he has no one to share it with. Hmm. But the real question is, why is he doing this? Yeah. And I don't have an answer. I honestly don't. I mean, I think. <laughs> I th- like what do you think I mean it, is it just that he honestly thinks Vane is that dangerous I mean Vane is obviously dangerous to the long term goal of getting the gold there and having it serve the purpose that Flint wanted mm-hmm. I mean yeah he's just trying to I think eliminate all those risks I mean he's kind of he's become a control freak he needs control over every bit of his plan and he doesn't trust anyone else I mean anyone else with even pieces of that puzzle right yeah and that's a huge piece of the puzzle to have the 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 fort that's going to protect the gold right but ruining the fort is also true It's it's a big risk too but he but like miranda said you can't make him see anything he sees what he sees but i mean uh, i mean this is where we get into like serious tragic hero territory like he he I think he believes that he he believes with all of his heart and soul that he is defending. Yeah, sure he does. This this ideal of Thomas's. But if you look at it from the outside. Yeah, he is not. No, And Thomas. I mean, look at him. He's even. Yeah. Right. He's even using the language of propaganda against pirates against pirates. Yeah. Oh, I don't mean to leave him on such a. (laughs) Let's talk about what we like best. Well, let's. But let, I feel let's like shift to this then, since because uh, it okay. is a little bit dismal. But that's all right. First, <laughs> <laughs> leave it to me. Well, let's shift to this. What was your favorite part of the episode? Okay. Um, I have two again. I'm so bad at this. <laughs> you I'm are so bad, bad at that's picking funny. one. Go I ahead. tried really hard. Uh-huh. Um. Okay, I'm just gonna say both of them. I'm sorry. Sure. I'm so bad mm-hmm. about this. Okay, one Flint's chair. I love that chair. It is oh, gorgeous. it is a gorgeous a chair. Yeah, time. yeah. We spent a lot of Wood time carving, looking at him sitting totally. in that chair. Yeah. Okay, I'll just pick that one. You okay. pick yours. And then if I have to, I'll add okay, on my last probably mine's one. Maybe my other one is yours. Uh, it might be. It, it's when James stands up at the dinner table and defends the Hamiltons. That's my favorite oh, part. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. That is, wasn't my other oh, it wasn't. one. Maybe it's, it's funny. That's one of my favorite <laughs> oh, moments so in the good. whole show. And yet so I'm moving. not choosing that. It's so funny. So lovely. I think because it's... I'm so tormented about it, yeah, even though I yeah. love it. Mm-hmm. So maybe I can't. I'm like trying to pick something like more joyous. <laughs> <laughs> it's glorious. Yeah, it is glorious. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Uh, my other one is actually the scene um, with Max and Adele and and uh, Jack, but but not. But I always thought that my favorite part of that scene was Max. Yeah, and it's not. My favorite part of that scene is watching Jack react to Max. Yeah. React to what mm-hmm. he's hearing that we talked about I can already. see that. Yeah. I can totally I was going to just pick that, but I had to stick the chair in yeah. because I just oh, fell gosh, in love gorgeous. with the chair yeah. this week. Mm-hmm. Just if you watch enough times, you end up looking at that chair and it is gorgeous. <laughs> Incredible workmanship. Yep. Incredible. Yeah. But yes, but I will, I think I will always on some level choose Jack's facial expressions yeah. over anything. Toby Schmitz. And those are, mm. yeah. So good. Yep. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. See, we, now we started with, now, we, now we're leaving on a nice yeah, note. Yeah. Um, and, and who won our uh, thesis statement last week? Who gets a pirate name? 
Well, we only have one person, okay. and I feel a little bad because it was such a hard episode. Oh, that's to... okay. Somebody won. We that's great. Had a hard if time. nobody won, then that would be one thing. But somebody did. Somebody did, and it's our dear Carla. Carla. Carla was the one person who chose our same thesis oh, statement. I love that girl. Okay, Carla. I love that girl too. Carla's pirate name is the Portuguese Man of War. Oh, <laughs> there you go, Carla. That's awesome. I like we it. Were, Man of War. Mm-hmm. Yes, we both we both adore you, so and you are so. definitely our Portuguese pirate. <laughs> I like it. So yeah, so that's it. Next week is a really big episode. Mm-hmm. It sure is. I'm already excited. Yes, yeah, there'll be a lot to talk about. Keep your thesis statements coming, and uh, do feel free to email us. Of course, we get great emails and conversations on Twitter. We love hearing. We love hearing from you all. We really do. It's just there's always there are always things that we haven't thought of mm-hmm. or didn't have time to talk about or you know every once in a while just things that were even outside of even things we had yes. begun to think about mm-hmm. and we love that it's so much fun with this great show absolutely all right well i think that wraps us up this week so until next time i'm liz stevens and i'm daphne Alu. we'll see you next week Fathoms Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag Fathoms Deep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening.